as you know, I'm the candidate for Scarborough Southwest for MPP. Uh, I have grown up in Scarborough Southwest. I've lived here for about 14 years. I went to school here, say Tech at W. Porter, that many of our kids are going now. I also went to um, University of Toronto, St. George. Um, I have a master's in development and planning uh, from UCL. And in terms of my career, I... Um, I UCL means University College University London. College London, London. sorry, <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, and um, I, I worked at the University of Toronto Students' Union for a few years. I've also, uh, I'm also the research officer uh, at Society of Energy Professionals, where we represent a lot of energy workers and lawyers, IT professionals. Um, and right now I'm on leave for the last, well, this few weeks yeah, for okay. election because we're canvassing. Um, yeah. And uh, I before, this, before that job, I was managing a campaign called Keep Hydro Public, which was to stop the sale of uh, privatization of Hydro One. Thank you, thank you. You have raised that uh, issue that you were involved in a campaign. This morning when I was watching television, I got the news that you know the Hydro One, they have uh, proposed or they have already increased the salary of their CEO and the board of directors. So this is one aspect. So keeping that in mind, since you were involved with that uh, campaign, so can you just give us some idea that before getting into politics, you got, you, as you said, that you got involved with that campaign. So can you just tell us something about that campaign? Of course. Um, it was it was a province-wide campaign. Uh, I'm really proud of the work that we did. Uh, we, we went across the province from, you know, from Scarborough to Thunder Bay to Sudbury um, and met people around the province um, just to see what pe people felt about the privatization. Because Hydro One, actually, uh, is just, you know, it's one of the few things that this province owns. And what, what I mean by that is people own it. So you and yeah. I own it. And anything that we earn from it, so the dividends actually come back to the province. Okay. So every year, about $749 million used to come back to the province for us to use for things like our schools, our hospitals. And uh, what, when the Liberal government decided to sell off Hydro One, about 83% of the people opposed it because we knew that things like the salary increase. So those bene benefits will not come to the society or this? Not, not anymore. Well, okay. it was to the province. So the government okay. would have that money to use it for things like our school, like repairing our schools, for example. Um, what happens now is about 53% of it is sold off to private shareholders, mm -hmm. which means that uh, the government doesn't have that control or Because majority is... Exact them. Exactly. Yeah. And when people opposed it, that was their biggest fear, is that it's, it's a golden goose, it, g it lays the egg, don't sell it. We don't have a lot of things we own anymore, so don't sell it. Um, but the Liberal government had, had a majority government, so they didn't really need, um, they, they were a little bit arrogant, in my opinion, uh, so they went ahead and sold it. And now what we're facing is CEOs getting you know, eight times more the salary than the years before, which uh, I, I think it's a little unfair because we've got you know, working class people who are still suffering, and electricity rates went up. Yeah, uh, it went up so much that some people are deciding between groceries and paying their electricity bill, or their rent and paying their electricity bill. Okay, that's how difficult it's been. That if you are elected, hopefully you will. So, what would be your priority for the first year? Uh, the first year, I think there are, there are quite a few priorities, but uh, what I want to do first is is what I you know mentioned before is to address child poverty. I want to make sure that. Uh, that people in this riding are represented well and their interest is heard. Um, I know our seniors have been raising their concerns about the way they're treated. We want to make sure that we address that. We want to make sure that our children are getting the best education they deserve. And we want to make sure that our parents who came here with you know, so many dreams, we turn them into reality. And I will make sure that I represent people's interest and I will be there and I will show up to things like the way uh, an employee of the people should. Assalamu alaikum. It's a real pleasure to be with you today and to have an opportunity to introduce myself, to let you know a little bit about who I am and why I'm doing this, what I'm all about. So I um, never expected to be doing this. I'm an academic. Uh, I was teaching at the University of Toronto at Mississauga, but I have to start a little bit farther back. I was born in South Africa. I come from a mixed background and my parents came to Canada when I was almost five years old to, to escape apartheid. 
When I was growing up in Montreal, I encountered uh, a lot of racism and it made me feel that I, that I did not belong. I never was able to feel comfortable. Uh, and it was very difficult for me to talk to my father about what was going on for me because my parents had made huge sacrifices uh, it was very difficult to, to leave, to come to a country that was new. What I was experiencing was, of course, not the staggering racism of South Africa, but nonetheless, I was still encountering a lot of you don't belong here. Um, I was coded as both um, a, a Jewish and black, and the okay. Jewish part was, you know, well, you're a Christ killer, but we can fix that, we can convert you to Christianity. But the black part was, you're not you're not really quite human, you're not the same as, or as good as the rest of us. So I spent my childhood thinking about these questions and what does it mean to belong and when I grew up I became an academic, I teach diaspora studies, uh, actually I was teaching diaspora studies at the University of Toronto and thinking about how do we create a socially just diverse society. So how do we create a society that is socially just that works for everybody, that makes everybody feel included, where nobody feels left out. And that's been sort of my, my life's work, to, to do research, to think, to write, and to teach about these kinds of subjects. So a couple of years ago, I actually got tired of doing research that kept showing me how deep systemic racism, including Islamophobia, is in this country, and I wanted to do something about it. There are people working in the public sector, in the government sector, there are people working in not-for-profits. The private sector has done some stuff, but it hasn't been very effective. So I decided that that's where I wanted to focus my work. So I started to prepare to work for boards of directors and senior management of private companies to help them figure out how to get rid of the Islamophobia and the racism from their organizations. That's good. That's going to make their organizations more successful more profitable and of course it's good for people who want to get jobs and rise within the organizations. So that's what I was doing when I got approached by the NDP in November and asked if I would run for so office. So have you been involved with the politics? Before? I've never been involved with politics and I never thought I would be involved with politics. I've been very involved with social justice work, um, with you know public speaking and, and working, doing online work, um, supporting communities, um, working against Islamophobia, working against uh, racism um, in the community, in various communities. So you know the issues and you are quite aware of I'm the I'm very situation. familiar with the issues, but I had never thought of politics. And my initial response was, <laughs> I'm not a politician, but then I realized that this was actually a really interesting opportunity to be able to talk about the need for systemic change. So how do we change the systems and the institutions so they work for everyone? And that's why I stepped up to do it. Thank you. So you have mentioned a number of things which will somehow or in many ways will also address the issue of poverty. Yes. But we, saw, we have seen that in huge number of families, I mean almost 13.4 Ontario families are living in poverty. So. Do you, apart from all these things you have mentioned, do you have any other specific plan that, uh, or, or how you are planning to assist this low income? For families? sure. So, I mean, I think it's really important to understand that poverty, poverty is the result of other factors. Poverty isn't itself the problem. The problem is the systems that lead to poverty. And if you don't understand it that way, you will always be throwing band-aids at poverty and you will never be fixing the problem. The problem is, why do you have communities that continue to live in poverty? What is going on to cause that? And then how do you fix those, those systems? So those, the, and, and I think that the NDP platform, what, why I'm excited about it is that it, it is doing a good job of getting at the root of so many of those things. People live in poverty because they can't afford, because they're, they've had precarious jobs where the, the, the wages have been too low, where they can't afford housing and their child care has been too they high. They don't have a permanent job as well. And they don't have a permanent job, sometimes because they can't get a permanent job because of the way that they observe their faith or because of their names or the color of their skin. So if you don't go back to tackling the systemic racism and the systemic Islamophobia, you, you can't 
alleviate some of those those issues. So it is about things like childcare and housing and transportation and hydro, but it is also about tackling that systemic racism and Islamophobia.